A group of friends go out into the woods to stay at an abandoned cabin for a weekend of fun and excitement, and end up getting more than they bargain for. Sounds quite cliché, doesn't it? But well, I think this one is done extremely well, and I'd very, very much like to introduce you now to my five collaborators this evening. If I try and list them all here, the introduction will end up being minutes long, but I'd really like you to take a look at their channels after you've listened to this, and give them a listen and like and subscribe to all their videos as well. Now, sit back and relax with your favourite drink, my dear, dear friends, because it's time to listen. Lucas has been trying for the best part of ten minutes when, finally, he gives up and places his phone in his back. That's it. I'm officially out of signal. He declares, defeated. No one seems to notice his frustration with the situation, so he digs a little for a response. We'll have Wi-Fi here, right? Chris puffs. <laughs> you should be happy you've got a roof over your head. We're in the middle of nowhere. Lucas rolls his eyes at the thought of an entire weekend of this. How far now? Nadia's head, which has been firmly nestled into her jacket and propped up against the truck's window for a good duration of the trip, lifts upright, and she squints as she gets her bearings. Chris continues speaking to the group. So I was reading about the land we built this cabin on. The people that once settled here had these... He pauses while he thinks for the correct word and then releases the wheel for a second, as he bends his fingers into quotation marks. These shamans, right? And they'd banish people who had been deemed no longer worthy to live with the tribe. So the shaman would take this person, and throw them into this small lake just away from the settlement. If they climbed out, they were free to go. Simple, right? They lived like this for thousands of years. He waits for that to sink in, and then continues. What gets me, though is that this lake is only about 20 meters round. I mean, it's less than a swimming pool, so how did so many people die? Nadia thinks about this for a second. How do you know so many died? She asks, intrigued. Chris raises his eyebrows. You'll see. It turned out Chris had been wrong, and they were only 25 minutes from their destination. He pulls the truck up along a path, shaded by a tunnel of trees that eventually give way to reveal the back side of the cabin. The long wooden logs that make up the outer walls almost make it fit in with the forest, but the solar panels that have been fitted to the slanted front side are a little more out of place. A pipe running along the ground from the lake provides a one-way flow of water. Some of it will be diverted into the hot water cylinder, where the solar panels will have been doing their job all day. Truly, the only thing it needs is time. Time will allow the logs to age, for moss to grow, and for the forest to slightly reclaim the little bit of land upon which the new cabin has been built. Each of them grabs a bag and heads toward the front of the building, and each one of them gasps as they round the corner. Down from a couple of wooden steps leading to the entrance, and through the trees, less than a stone's throw away, is the lake. No path has yet been forged out from the forest floor, and it all looks entirely untouched. The warped tree trunks surrounding the lake are a fuzzy green from a covering of moss, and the thin canopy of trees allow light to permeate through to the ground and glitter onto the floor. The clearing above the lake is an unblemished blue. It takes the five of them a couple of trips from the truck to unload their world for the weekend, although junk food and alcohol take up a majority of the items that aren't clothes. Inside, the cabin is an open-plan lounge area, with a wood fire and a small kitchen in the corner. A hallway leads to a double room for Jenny and Josh, and a twin for Nadia and Lucas. Chris is currently on the sofa, but, well, a lot can happen in a weekend. It didn't take long for the drinks to start flowing. In the early evening, Lucas hooks his phone to a Bluetooth speaker and heads outside for a cigarette. He watches as the sun hides further and further behind the trees. Jenny and Nadia are laughing and chatting on the sofa, their drinks leaving watermarks on the wooden table where the condensation has dripped down from the glass. Cards are scattered across the table, 
abandoned from a game earlier in the evening. Meanwhile, in the kitchen area, Josh's eyes are bright with excitement. You should go for it, man, he says eagerly, unambiguously looking over at Nadia. He turns to Chris and lowers his voice slightly. I'll make sure I put in a good word for you throughout the night. He winks. In fact, I'll take Jen to the woods now, and you go make a move. Before Chris can talk him out of it, Josh is walking over to the ladies. He lifts his chin like a king and places his hand out before Jenny, inviting her to join him. She raises her eyebrows at Nadia, and then takes a large gulp of her drink with one hand and Josh's hand with the other. Together, they walk out through the veil of Lucas's smoke and down toward the lake. You know, you never told me. Nadia advises Chris, biting the end of the straw in her drink as he awkwardly wanders over. He hums and sits down, taking a sip from his own. Hmm. Oh, what's that? You said once we got here, you'd tell me why you knew so many people were... She pauses for dramatic effect. Banished in the lake. This isn't quite the way he wanted the conversation to go, but he laughs. <laughs> Not true. He points out. I said you'll see. She sucks air through her teeth, pretending to be in a predicament. That's true. She admits. Nadia stands up and takes him by the hand. I guess you'll just have to show me. Josh chases Jenny to the lake until her feet are on white sand and she's out of breath. She turns to Josh to plea for him for forgiveness, but he simply wraps his arms around her waist and kisses her. A hand in hand Chris and Nadia, followed by Lucas, make their way to the small lake as well. Chris was continuing the legend. So, if you don't want to make it out of the lake in the world you left... It means you have been sent to join. Mocking her, he pauses for dramatic effect as well. The Banished. In this place, you will age forever, slowly losing knowledge of everything you once knew. Your body will hunger for human flesh and will deteriorate until, after hundreds of years, the hunger forces you to throw yourself back into the lake, knowing it will mean certain death. Once they reach the lake, Chris bends down and scoops up a handful of sand. It's pure white, Nadia says. Chris stares at her for a couple of seconds. It's bones, he says. Once you jump back into the lake, your bones just join the rest of the banished in this world. He rubs his hands free of the human remains and then points to the water. In the dim light of the sunset, the surface is so still and clear, it looks as though molten glass has crept up through the ground to encase what lies beneath. On the lake bed, Eroded hips, kneecaps, and every other bone in the body can be seen. Chris dips his arm in the water and retrieves a skull worn smooth over time. That's amazing, says Nadia, taking the skull. Lucas dips his hand into the water and picks out a slightly curved, smooth, and flat bone. It will be impossible to tell which part of the body it came from. He skims it along the water and exhales a puff of smoke. Jenny screams, and the three of them turn their heads to see her kicking the air as Josh, laughing, lifts her onto his shoulders. He takes a few paces forward until the water is up to his thighs, and then launches her into the lake. Water settles. Seconds pass. Josh's laugh slows until panic stops him from breathing completely. Jen? He asks, hesitantly. Jenny? He waits another couple of seconds. Beneath the surface, all he can see is white. Jenny? He shouts. Chris, Lucas and Nadia share a look, and then all three rush over to help. Chris and Josh dive in to search the water. Lucas scouts the surrounding area while Nadia checks the cabin. Jenny is gone. Jenny jumps out of the water, flicking her hair back and feigning anger. She wipes the water from her eyes and sees immediately that everything is different. She is alone and the air 
is heavy with silence. She calls for each of her friends by name, but her voice barely travels in the thick air. She takes a few steps out of the water toward where the cabin should be, but it's gone. Around her are only trees with long shadows, dipped in gold from a setting sun. Dread clutches her. Jenny steps out of the water warily. Between the trees, and quite some distance away, she sees a figure. It had been human once. Quite when, or how it had become what it is now, it had no way of knowing. For years, it has wandered the banished lands. Over time, clumps of purple and black tumors have grown, and now they extend the size of a rucksack on its back where a vile black liquid seeps out from within the cracks and drips between its feet. Dead, yellow skin, sunk into the bone, swells with each step, as ancient muscles try and shuffle the body onward. Broken, unhealed bones and dislocated joints hinder its progress. By the time the sun had set, this banished would have thrown itself into the lake. The hunger has become too great. The situation has rendered Jenny somewhat cautious, but despite this, she calls to the figure and breaks the silence around her. From behind, she carefully moves toward the shape. Slow steps, rustling leaves. The form stops moving, and its whole body goes rigid. Slowly, the head twists as far left as it can go. Then the shoulders turn, and in the fading light, Jenny can see the tumors bubbling from its back. She plants her hands over her mouth to stop herself from screaming and quickly cowers behind a tree, eyes wide with terror. The banished can barely see through the black tears that leak from its eyes, but its ears are sensitive. It takes quick, uncoordinated steps toward the sound it has heard. The mostly intact left leg strides forward, but then the right leg clips the kneecap floating out of its socket. It catches momentarily, and the weight of the body crunches through it until the leg slightly buckles inwards. Jenny can hear the creature getting closer with every passing second. With a quick whimper, she darts to the tree ahead of her, slightly further from the banished, but slightly closer to the lake. She begins to cry. Her tears... A black. It's impossible, Josh protests. He's soaked through from the lake, his hair matted against his head, eyes wild. It's the only explanation, Nadia says, collected. She, Lucas and Chris, had decided the story sounds better coming from her. We should bring her back, Chris adds. I know it sounds crazy, but we need a blood sacrifice. It allows the banished to get back through without... He doesn't want to finish the sentence. Josh marches up to the cabin without another word. He rips open the door, grabs a small knife from the kitchen in the corner, and proceeds back to the lake. In the water? He asks, restless. The three of them nod, and Josh makes little noise as the blade slices down his palm. He squeezes his fist, and the first few drops of blood drip from his hand. It's almost dark. Jenny darts from tree to tree to avoid the thing hunting her footsteps. From between two trees, the banished spots a blurred figure through hollowed eyes and lets out a pained wail that echoes beyond the forest. With a long, labored breath, the creature begins to run. It only manages to remain upright because the hunger is more powerful than any pain. It sprints from tree to tree, the left leg still crunching and buckling with every step. It grapples a trunk for a second before heading off in a more narrow direction. It's getting closer. In the near distance, the scream has alerted more banished. One, close to the lake on the other side, is standing upright and looking straight at Jenny. Purple and black tumors bubble around from the left shoulder, 
and the same black liquid covers the body from the chest down. It wails, and, unhindered from broken bones or dislocated joints, begins to run. Jenny rubs her eyes and struggles to hold in a scream when her fingers are sticky with black liquid. She rubs it off onto her blouse, staining it with two black hand impressions. She turns around to see how close her original hunter is, when, suddenly, out of the darkness that has settled over the banished lands, hundreds of tiny lights appear. They are about waist high, shaped like a basin and speckled like paint flicked from a brush. And there they hover, in the middle of the forest, just up from the lake. Slightly further away, more of the speckled lights lay out in a perfect square, just above the ground, illuminating the dead leaves and grass beneath. Just do it, Lucas says, going against any and all of his survival instincts. Without another word, Josh picks him up with one arm under his legs and another under his arm. In one swift motion, he throws Lucas into the lake. Jenny hears a splash. She whips her head back around from the lights to see Lucas springing up from the water. He takes a quick look around. Right in front of him, he sees the banished with tumors growing around its shoulders, its lower body drenched in black liquid, running. To his right, Jenny is cowering behind the trunk of a tree. Her blouse is stained the color of her eyes, which have two distinct black rivers running down her cheeks. Behind her, the stumbling, hunched banished is only seconds away. Further in the distance, lights from nowhere paint onto the ground. Lucas! She screams, half in terror, half in delight. It takes him just a second to process what he's seen. He swears under his breath. Jenny! He shouts, running towards her, knee-deep in the water. Jump in the lake! She runs towards him, and they meet at the shore. Without hesitation, they sprint back into the water and hurl themselves beneath the surface. The two banished are not far behind. In the near distance, another has been drawn to the noise. Jenny and Lucas leap out of the water, and Josh immediately runs to their side. Jenny's cheeks were washed clean of the fluid, but her blouse bears the marks, and the entirety of her eyes are pitch black. Josh's jaw drops open for a split second, and Jenny whimpers against his chest as he accompanies her out of the water. Lucas flaps his hand at Nadia, and she passes him his cigarettes, and he lights one, shakily. Let's get the fuck inside. He says. Jenny downs a couple of glasses of water, and Nadia refills it every time. Chris gets a bath running, and then they all sit in the lounge as Jenny recounts her story. From seeing the creature with the tumors, to the lights on the ground, to Lucas and her diving back into the water. Oh, shit. Lucas whispers, staring out of the window. From the settling water in the lake, a head appears, followed by a pair of shoulders with purple and black tumors arching around to the left. The creature pulls at the water as it heads toward the cabin. The others look out of the window. In no time, it has made its way out of the water. It starts to run. Lucas opens the door just a touch before Josh slams it shut. We won't make it, he asserts, reading Lucas's thoughts for an early escape. Lucas locks eye contact with Josh and then nods. They grab one of the sofas and barricade the door closed, just as the creature outside slams into the wood. Chris and Nadia are up against the back wall of the cabin, eyes wide with fright. Jenny, however, is still sat on the second sofa, black eyes staring at the glass in front of her. The creature outside howls once again, and slams fists and body into the door. Jenny picks up her glass, 
fills it with water from the tap, and sets it aside. She stares at the droplets of water in the base of the sink and clinging to the sides. Chris, she says, her voice almost a whisper. Is this water from the lake? What? He asks, incredulous. She turns around, stunned in her realization. The water, she says, both matter-of-factly and utterly horrified. Black tears roll from each of her eyes. The lights I saw were from the water in the sink. Josh and Chris are still firmly pushing against the door, but both slack off and stare at Jenny. The pounding on the door was nothing compared to the weight of what she has just said. Slowly, two dead fingers rise out from the glass of water Jenny has put to the side. The skin is purple, black, blistered and peeling. The fingernails are loose. Everyone watches in stunned silence as the fingers work their way around the rim of the glass, bending, flexing and looking for something they can cling to. They find nothing, and slink back beneath the surface. They can all come back! Jenny cries, black tears falling from her eyes. Through the water! They can all come back! A couple of very long, heavy seconds pass. I drank the water, she whispers. This is the last thing Jenny manages to say. From within her stomach, a dead hand reaches out and grabs her flesh inside its fist. The hand pulls down, back towards the layer of lake water Jenny has drunk, and her stomach rips away from the rest of her body. The hand releases its grip and then flails and thrashes around. Jenny drops to the floor, writhing on the ground and screaming in pain. As the portal from the lake water falls within her stomach, the hand is cut from its host and is left inside a dying, lurching Jenny. Josh drops to her side, calling to her, shaking her shoulders, distraught. There is nothing he can do. Her body is almost lifeless. Her eyes roll back in their sockets. Blood seeps from her mouth. And then she is still. Josh stands up. There are tears in his eyes, a mix of anger and sorrow. For now, the front door is secure, and the banished outside have taken to scraping down the wood, losing fingernails and skin in the process. Jenny's body is almost still when Chris, helplessly running his hands through his hair, looks over to Josh. The bath, he says. Josh picks up the hatchet from the side of the unlit fire and marches over to the door. He stands outside for a brief moment, listening to the water falling from the tap. Chris is right behind him, while Lucas and Nadia are back against the front door. Josh slowly opens the door and the brand new hinges ease open silently. Before the two young men, a single banished attempts to climb out of the half-full bar. Its face is a deluge of tumours and weeps black liquid into the water, against the porcelain and onto the floor. The creature had obviously needed to lie down to climb back up through the water, but doesn't appear to possess the capacity to heave itself upright. For a brief moment, the two of them stare at the thing. It wails and thrashes around in the water when it notices them. The sticky black fluid drips from the gums, and then Josh brings the hatchet down on the side of the thing's head. A few of the tumours burst open and spray onto the walls and floor and onto the two of them. The creature gargles, the blade stuck into its head. Josh pries the axe from the wound and, with a second swing, the banish stops moving completely. Its body falls limp against the bar. Josh retrieves the hatchet. The body slumps back into the water and disappears out of sight, back into the other realm. Chris pulls the plug from the bar. 
The four of them regroup back in the lounge. We're going to make a break for it, Chris says, sounding more hopeful than he really is. Nadia and Lucas nod. Chris picks up a few of the sofa cushions and passes one to each of the unequipped survivors. Use these as a shield. Lucas, you open the door. I'll take it down. Jess is going to kill it. He pauses for a second while Nadia retreats and the three of them get into position. One, two, three, he shouts. Lucas whirls the door open and Chris sprints through the gap, slamming into the banished that had lost all of its fingernails and burst a majority of the bubbles around its shoulder. He knocks it to the ground and Josh runs around the head of the creature. With one blow, the thing stops moving entirely. Nadia runs out of the cabin, and all four of them stare towards the lake. At least three more banished of varying states of decay are emerging from the water. Another head appears, then another. Go, Josh says solemnly. Get to the truck. Lucas, Chris, and Nadia begin to run. Just before he rounds the corner, Chris looks back. Josh isn't running with them. Josh! He yells, but he doesn't turn around. He circles the hatchet around in his hand and plants his foot back in a fighting stance. Three banished have left the water with varying ease. Chris turns back to the two ahead of him. Go! Go! He says. Let's go! Chris hops in the front of the truck. Lucas and Nadia jump in the back. Josh hears the truck start from behind the cabin. He is ready to fight every one of these creatures. He takes a couple of steps backwards as the closest banished strides ever nearer. From around the side of the cabin, the truck swoops round. Chris accelerates and crashes into the banished halfway up from the lake. He leans over the passenger seat and opens the door. Get in, hero. Josh is dumbstruck. He pauses for a second, but then jumps into the car. Chris spins the wheels and whips the less-than-agile truck around the far side of the cabin, back onto the trail, and away from the lake, as fast as he possibly can. So, a fairly standard horror trope there, the cabin in the woods, but I think that one was done really, really well. And, of course, another massive thank you to all of the collaborators in this story. Um, they're all upcoming narrators, so do me a little favor with you. Go to their channels and give them some love and a bit of support, just to encourage them to keep going. Oh, well, back again with the continuation of my series tomorrow. Hope you'll all join me again. I know, Tuesday. Don't usually do one on Tuesday, but I am this week just for all of you. <laughs> well, that's enough for me for one evening. Hope you enjoyed that one. Comments below, and I will do my best to reply to as many as I can. That's all for me for this evening, though. So, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>